Cash Flow Diary Podcast, episode 527. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast, the podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leveraged streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's Cash Flow Game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you are here today because we are going to talk about something that absolutely matters to each and every one of you and your businesses right now, whether you realize it or not. We are talking about branding, marketing, and most importantly, staying relevant. One of the things that we all must do is we must find that audience, stay relevant with that audience because they will quickly forget about us unless we're doing the right things. You got to know where they are, who they are, why they're listening and looking or even shopping with you in the first place. And I think what you're going to learn today is how to do exactly that. Now, for those of you who happen to have a business or service that is targeted toward a younger demographic, you're probably going to benefit the most. But here's what I know that our guest today, Greg Witt, is going to help all of us become bigger, better, better entrepreneurs because he is the chief strategy officer over at Engage Youth. And what it comes down to, ladies and gentlemen, is exactly what he does. Now, you must know that he's a former pro skateboarder, which I have never met any of them. So this is going to be interesting just to think about. To me, it's like, wow, skateboarding. My feet were just too big and skateboards never really worked out. But he's also... A dad. And I think that's cool too. But ultimately, when you say serial entrepreneur or someone who's there dedicated, making sure that entrepreneurship and that message continues to grow and flow, well, that's Greg. Nonetheless, today, ladies and gentlemen, here's what I want you to do I want you to get ready to receive quality information, get ready to learn, get ready to love, and let's listen to Greg Witt. Greg, how you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. I'm glad that you are here. We've got lots of questions for you. But before we go there, I have to ask you the same question I tend to ask everybody the first time that they're here. You ready? Let it rip. Okay. Uh, so I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes, you know, like Batman, Robin, Wonder Woman, etc. Because I think entrepreneurs and superheroes have a ton of things in common. For example... There, if you, I can imagine myself, if you will, uh, like a superhero flying around town, using our products and services, saving our customers one sale at a time. And yes, at that moment, I'm probably wearing a cape. However, just like a superhero, an entrepreneur has a beginning. So if you think about Spider-Man, there was a time where he was just a kid going to school, doing his thing. And then one day he gets bit by a spider, discovers he's got a superhuman ability. And now he has to choose whether to use it for good or for evil. So my question to you is as follows. Before your book, the, the Gen Z Frequency, before Engage Youth, before even being a pro store, uh, skateboarder or dad, what we really want to know is, who is Greg Witt? Ooh, yeah, I, I'm the guy who, who brings, brings everyone together for the party. <laughs> 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 no, no, that, that's, that's probably... Um, that's probably just my gift or, or my love. I, I'm, you know, somebody who likes to problem solve in ways that are, are like, as you said, relevant with, with younger audiences, more importantly, that are relevant and, and connect with the, the cultures or the cultural background of, of the individuals and, you know, the people that, that brands are targeting, I mean, I guess you said before engage youth. <laughs> yes, so I, I know. I'm trying to. I'm trying to stay stay aligned with what you're asking me. You know, 
Well, that, we want to know the man behind the man right now. That that's what we're talking about. Before it, you know, the Greg that we see in all the marketing and on stage and etc. We want to know who the Greg like the Greg that picked up that first picked up that skateboard. Oh, who, I was gonna say, you know, so yeah, going there. It's just if you if you little back histories, and I was just the you know the scrawny skateboarding kid. I mean, I think that's that's really the the moment of of where I first found my identity, where mm. I first found you know my 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 passion, you know, my heart for for doing something other than you know what everyone does is has breakfast in the morning and goes to school and tries to be a good kid. <laughs> yeah, just, <laughs> you know what I mean? I, like I found I found skateboarding, or or maybe skateboarding found me. But when when I was thirteen years old. Um, I we built a skateboard ramp in my backyard, and I I, I became a competitive athlete on the the national circuit mm. at that time, and um, we ended up building a a larger skateboarding facility in a warehouse uh, in Winona, Minnesota, and it became a uh, a cultural hub for professional riders worldwide. Mm. And it really gave me a chance to connect with a bigger world because I lived in a small town. It was a great town. It's called Winona, Minnesota, but it was a small town. And let's face it, we didn't have the internet <laughs> or, or <laughs> Instagram. It wasn't sending snaps. There wasn't, you know, yeah, googling anything. Um, you, you, if you didn't get in a vehicle or an airplane, you know, you were, uh a villager, you know, you were a person of your, your community or your region. Right. So right. the skateboarding was also my love, but it was my connection to the, to the bigger world. And, um, you know, I didn't have any career plans. I didn't really think work was something for me. Um, to hmm. be honest, I, um, just thought it was work was what my busy dad did. And, <laughs> and my dad's awesome, but you know, he was a, he was a quality workaholic. So as, as a younger person, you know, a kid, he, he saw that and he knew that was like, that's a good dude. But you're also like, I don't want to do that work <laughs> works crazy. Like work means we, this guy gets up at before the sun comes up, you know, rises and comes back, you know, after dinner usually, or, before, you know, and, looks busy. <laughs> it doesn't look fun to me, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, but I didn't, I didn't have a one aspirational career goal, but I knew having cultivated this deep community of, of fellow skateboarders and, and just friends and people that were, you know, highly creative that I wanted to find a way to keep those good times flowing, you know? Mm. Um, and, when I was 16 years old, later later that year, I started a, a skateboard company called Good Times. <laughs> and, uh, because I, my friends and I were sponsored by major brands like Vans, and I was originally sponsored by Clockwork Skateboards by a really uh, you know underground brand by a popular skateboarder Brian Patch, and and we were kids, and you know as as young teens, all we really could do was complain about the stuff that we got from companies, right? Um, we were like B and C level sponsored athletes, <laughs> but we could find a way to complain about anything. And I remember sitting at the kitchen table saying, you know, you know, F it, we're, we're going to go do this ourselves, and hmm. do that. And this is going to be how we keep this party going, but we, we also will have the, the things that we want and that we need. So Long, you know, that's a complex, long-winded story. But I, I did, as I said, started Good Time Skateboards in in '91, and by the end of that same year, it became a global brand distributed in like 30 countries. And you know that didn't suck, but it was huh. also quite a roller coaster ride. Just um, <laughs> having like a couple older mentors, um, you know, a few different people that I could draw on. You know, thank God my dad also ran a. Uh, a vending and catering business and they knew, you know, general basics of running a business. So we had some guardrails, but not a lot. <laughs> he was very much this guy that would say, you know, here's the small college fund, you know, good luck. 
Um, <laughs> but you know, you've got a, you know, a labor job here, you know, if, if things don't work out, but that was my dad, you know, he was cool. He was like, this kid's going to figure out, you know, and, and he's either going to make it or he's going to fail. He's probably going to do both. And I did. And, you know, I don't know. I mean, you, you ask your first part of the question was great. Cause you asked who's the person behind this, you know, whatever. I'm a business guy. I'm a youth marketing dude, but I didn't start off with a lot of confidence. Mm. People, when, when I was young, like people made fun of me. Um, but not as bad as maybe some kids, you know, today, but it definitely was made fun of a lot. And when I got, when I was in my, my teen years mm-hmm. being, having this, skateboarding warehouse this hub this place where music and skateboarding and art and everything collided was i got kind of i attained a level of popularity then for sure um and then when i started the company you know i i I found out the other side of people where it was like you know i heard people saying or or people would tell me uh, he'll never make it work you know he doesn't know how to do that shit (laughs) he's never (laughs) it off dude you just see that guy you know how whatever that guy is you know man he's too crazy you know he'll never make it work and i would just hear that and i'm not saying that that is what should drive other people but for me the more and more that i heard people tell me i wasn't going to make it the more it became like part of my driving force mm-hmm. to just make it i'm going to prove that guy wrong in fact i'm going to make it so good that we're in like three magazines. I'm going to be like at five different contests. I'm going to make sure that we show up in their town and then I'm going to rub it in their face. <laughs> you know, because it was, you know, I don't think that rebellion is a Gen X thing, but man, it just like the group that I was in was certainly like the stereotypical, just <laughs> rebellion. Um, because, different than it is for Gen Z millennials and everyone else. Like I, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not telling you how old you are, but I'm just saying that was a real deal. Like those stereotypes, jocks, skaters, you know, whatever, whatever you go on and on. Those were a real deal. That was something, you know, d- that young people had to navigate. And so I kind of went through that whole up and down of, of being kind of sort of a bit of a kid who didn't fit in. Right. I don't think that I'm a special or anything, but just, a kid who didn't fit in to a kid who really fit in because had something to offer a lot of people, you know, I was putting it bluntly. Right. And then starting this company, you know, you started kind of going, wow, these people are really cool to me, but I'm giving them stuff. <laughs> and then you're like, you know, flowing people product, you know, some guys on stat, you know, on athletes that were paid, you know, whatever, you know, kind of stuff. And, um, and then hearing you know, all these other people that you thought, man, these guys are, I think I'm close with these people, right? They're supposed to be my, my people, mm. but I ain't either they're telling me to my face, which was a little bit more respectable. And then I would just hear it over and over and over again. Oh my gosh. Who, in the, in the, in who's this kid? And he's, oh, clearly he'll never make it. Mm. And then like year three, you know, it's still here. Well, you know, he got lucky mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. five, you know, what's this kid doing? <laughs> you know, you're that. And then I was like, by year five or so, I was like, you know, damn right. You know, right. Like, and even like at year five, I still didn't even really know what I was doing. I just understood. I had just gone through all those lessons of sales, you know, general marketing on the grassroots kind of level, print media, um, you know, events. I didn't, I still by year five hadn't really up, you know, I didn't figure out brand consistency until, you know, probably like I started my first agency in 99. (laughs) So, and we're talking, you know, we're way back there in the early nineties at this point with good times. So, you know, one thing I learned about brand identity then was how to be, you know, consistently inconsistent and Mm. (laughs) it resonated for sure. But when you look back, you say, Oh my gosh, what could have I really done with that? Mm. Um, Not like, you know, I, I'm happy with that journey, but just, you know, wow, we were so inconsistent. You know, we'd, we'd, we'd spin up a new logo if we got feedback that said they didn't like the logo. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> just, just one example. Um, but it was an interesting, that was my, you know, real world university, if you will. Um, hmm. And it was cool. We did some, we did some pretty, pretty, uh, 
pretty epic things. I mean, it was one of the first three skateboarding brands to originate like outside of the East and the West Coast. So, um, you know, Good Times, Molotov, lesser known brand, but Alien Workshop, very well known brand. You know, we all stood for like our roots and basically had a presence in California on the West Coast, but that was mostly for branding and team, our team, our athlete team called influencers in quotes, right? Um, and, um, but we would kind of keep it real and keep our base in Minnesota and, um, you know, took some risks to do that, but, but it, it worked out and, you know, that led to, and eventually you know, China kind of, we, all of our boards were made in the United States and, and then the mm. China started to figure out skateboarding and it was a big shift in where products was manufactured and became that action sports, but really that skateboarding industry became more of a price thing mm. and wasn't something that I was necessarily really good at. Um, you know, I was more about building brand and, and making really high quality product with, you know, one or two of the top factories that sort of adopted me when I was younger to, to be in this business thing where it was mom price, price, price. And, you know, there was lower margin and, and I, at the, so at that time I was, I was offered to run, um, one of two, uh, boutique footwear brands in the streetwear space and with connections to skateboarding, but certainly a broader market. And, um, so I, I I launched two footwear brands before Nike came in and and figured out the mm-hmm. SB brand and took everybody out of business. <laughs> um, but it was cool. I learned how to build footwear and apparel brands and sort of what, everything that was involved with that, which was also like a little bit more sophisticated and and taught me really valuable lessons of um, to build a bigger lifestyle brand. And then I kind of. I guess through friends and networks and my, my crew, I just ended consulting with entertainment and beverage brands, um, including that brand that put vitamins in water and everyone thought it was gross for a year. (laughs) And uh, I I did a lot of uh, influence influencer. I called it influence marketing now, but um, for them. And, and then in 1999 I started one of the the first youth focused marketing agencies in the country. Um, You know, and, just kind of stumbled into it. I wouldn't say accident and certainly stumbling is, is a, you know, a bit <laughs> off saying that like, you know, cause you know, you, cause you're basically at the end of the day, what we're all trying to do is survive. And so I was on this, you know, sort of self-made trajectory that ended up making so much sense. So, you know, is it small, a little mm-hmm. bit broader and then broad and then, you know, an agency, um, and it's funny because I was doing a lot of this consulting work with um, sort of the premier uh, playground company for their youth focused products, something I, you know, started to got into. And I, I remember one day, you know, this, this original company I had was premise mm. immersive marketing. And it was just kind of, we just did stuff that people asked us to do. <laughs> there wasn't a focus, if you will. Um, and I remember going into, the uh, the president's office uh, at the time the the late Barb King and they were uh, my couple of my my friends or colleagues at the time they were like you're our youth market consultants and I was like oh that's what we do we're consultants <laughs> I was like oh okay, great I'm gonna go back and change this agency name we're you know a consulting and marketing agency that's what we do mm-hmm. um, there's a business for that I was so enamored in in uh, 99 that it was like the secret had been revealed like there's this thing you can do and you can sell your service you can sell your brain and you didn't have to buy stuff <laughs> so, and i was like it's a thing it really works um but that was just me coming out of this like long life of of myopic um you know skateboarding action sports you know keep it core keep to your core audience uh you know anything to mass markets a sellout you know this is just where i came from <laughs> so, right right um but cemented me in in everything that i know today right so i just understand um you know how to connect with culture and and and, and inherently the sort of principles and and so forth around 
youth marketing that are that are timeless and you know and eventually eventually you get older and you learn frameworks and strategy and, and um, how to build bigger businesses and 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 you know at that point you're you know have you know sold a youth marketing agency have been very successful since 99 just kind of growing upward sometimes faster sometimes slower but just always up and uh, and uh, just yeah, I sold my my agency uh, immersive youth um, to a company and did two years time as an executive vice president, learned the, you know, the bigger agency, you know, executive vice president guy role and, and, uh, did my time, uh, as contracted and, uh, launched my new agency engage youth co with arguably some of the most brilliant people in, in the youth marketing space, people we've worked with for, you know, 20 years, except for the Gen Z years, probably like four, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Launched it last Wednesday, man. Uh, so um, I'm an entrepreneur in the heat of it right now. I'm just thankful that some of these, um, you know, Fortune 100 companies wanted to buy into my vision and be part of it. So I was able to onboard with, you know, with clients that'll be released coming up when our when our work is uh, is uh, launched or released, so so to speak. No. In listening to your story, there's something that I see as a as a through line, and you called it uh, surviving. I, I often call it adapting or dying. <laughs> you have yeah, no I like choice. it. I like that too. Yeah. And yet, you know, in today's you know marketplace, one of the things that businesses must do is figure out how to adapt, and part of that adapting, uh, at least. Uh, and maybe I'm wrong here, but I think you're going to agree is is regardless of what your product or service is today, it seems as though building an audience is something you must do regardless. Whether you feel like, you know, you're a personality online or social media, you, you must produce content in some written visual or audio format. What What do you say about that? Hello there, entrepreneur. This is Jay Massey. And what I want to say to you is that the number one mistake that I have ever made in business, number one, has been waiting too long to do the books, waiting too long to get the bookkeepers, the accountants, the CPAs, the CFOs involved. And I don't want you to make that same mistake. That mistake cost me over six figures, and now for a significant discount, you have the ability to get your books together using FreshBooks. So what I want you to do is I want you to go over to gofreshbooks.com forward slash cash flow diary. Again, that's gofreshbooks.com forward slash cash flow diary. FreshBooks is the easy to use software designed to help you, the small business owner, the freelancer, get organized and save time on invoicing, getting paid faster, keeping those books in order so that it becomes a bonus for you to do your taxes as opposed to a burden. Go over to gofreshbooks.com forward slash cash flow diary and get started today. And now let's get back to the rest of the story. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you're 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 an audience you build a following however you want to call it or you're risking uh you know a one-hit wonder you're risk you're risking everything if you don't have an audience of of people that are passionately subscribing to whatever it is that you're putting out you know a product a message you know a service i i think just pure convenience and and pure um, utility. Um, there's I guess there's a few places for that. I mean, particularly in monopoly industries. But everything is. I'm saying I don't even like saying this, but everything is disruptible. <laughs> I mean, I really I'm not, I don't I don't I don't want to go down the whole like disruption thing. It's a it's a weird word, but I think but but if you are are thinking about focusing on on building an audience you know it's it's mandatory it's not an option well i i just know that there's a number of people who maybe feel like well i do i have brick and mortar i have a retail or specifically uh you know there's uh, in the real estate investing world 
And even more specifically, we practice short-term rentals. So we have, you know, a, a bevy of short-term rentals in various jurisdictions. And many of the people who listen do the same. It, it can feel like, oh, I don't need to do that. That can be the attitude. My position has been, no, I, I think you do. But I would love to hear your thoughts why even someone who's in an industry like, you know, real estate or some brick and mortar business, which still it's still necessary. Well, look, even in its fundamental, um, you know, use of building an audience or function is that you're sharing stories that are going to attract the renters that are going to attract investors. Sometimes it's just awareness to break through the noise. Um, you know, let's face it also, like sometimes people buy or make big decisions because they like you. Right. And I see, a, I can't name like the names right now, but even just on LinkedIn with LinkedIn video, I've seen a lot of really successful. I, I believe they portray that they're successful. Let me, let me, let me say that. But they, they tell stories about, you know, how they got into the real estate and they're not necessarily the features of what they have to sell. They're not selling a property per se, but they might have an artistic expression of showing it, but they're talking about how they got into it, you know, why they care about it. They're just telling their particular story around that. And yet, you know what they do. And there's several of them that, that I've, and I wish I would, I could recall them. That's not what I thought we were going into, but I think it's good. Um, but, But I would consider talking to them about a property. Just mm-hmm. because of, like, I know who they are. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then they've given me this, which is really important about building an audience because let's just face it, you're starting, if, if you're building a quality audience, you're, you're establishing some level of trust. And trust is just no one, no industry, no business that, that having a trusted group of people you can't benefit from. Right. So I think that that's, uh, you know, inherent with building an audience, you know, people will, will trust you. And I think, I mean, I've run into, I run into this all the time. So I guess, you know, I just haven't tackled it from a real estate perspective recently, but, um, I don't need to do that. (laughs) You know what I have heard though? This is, this will surprise you. And I won't. What's that? I won't cross any confidential lines or anything, but I, I have I have been in boardrooms very recently where, you know, I've been, you know, because, you know, I actually work, you know, I do this work. I'm not just this guy who talks about it all the time. So I'm just, just throwing that out there. <laughs> but <laughs> I've been in uh, the boardroom recently where, you know, you were, we've developed an influence, you know, focused sort of strategy with brand collabs and you'll be moving on down through the, presentation, you know, explaining this, this program, if you will. And all of a sudden, you know, the, someone around the CMO sort of level says, why, you know, why do that? And I'll go, oh, well, let's take a break. Hold on. Why? Let's see. Clearly we didn't, you know, explain the, uh, the strategy well enough. So let's talk a little bit more why about doing this. And then, and let's, let's tip our hand to the sort of the, the earned media value at the end, you know, the outcomes, no, why? I'm like, what? Knocked off my seat. And to hear this in in 2018, 2019, why should our, and this is retail, because I wanted to touch on something you said with retail. Retail, why should we do that type of marketing when we, when we do, you know, broadcast TV and our TV commercials are very successful? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I just slump back in my seat and I just think, well, how am I going to answer this? How am I going to break it to this person that is probably inevitably in charge of, of my fate here? <laughs> Tell them that it ain't working. Right. It ain't, you can't measure that you're touching, you're not touching, but you're, you're reaching this audience. It's not happening, my friend. And to say that in such a nice, elegant way that doesn't hurt their feelings because these companies for the last several decades have their friends and their colleagues, their buddies, and they produce these beautiful commercials and just live in the false perception that that's what's working. Now I'm not here to say that 
TV's bad or it doesn't do something at the top of the funnel, but you can't tie that to a conversion. It's not happening, you know. And we all know that there's some mix of integration that that moves the needle um, always. And so it's just it's just amazing um, the the problems out that that out there that are actually so basic that you can solve. Um, so but, let, but we're talking about audience building. So yeah, well, and let Bye. me ask you this: let's let's pretend an entrepreneur starting today, you know, mm-hmm. um, they they woke up this morning, they're like, you know what, I, I'm gonna start something, I'm gonna make something happen. Uh, do you have you know a, a go to strategy that can help them reach their target market in the most efficient manner? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, I don't know if it's right for everyone, but it's principle based. Okay. I think you, I think first though, I think first you, you, before you even think about truths or principles, first you just have to say, what's my purpose. Right. And I'm not here to be the guy who's like the millionth person to start preaching purpose driven, but, but honestly, what's the purpose? (laughs) But but what's the purpose? Right. right? Right. I mean, I knew my purpose. I told you my purpose. My purpose was simple. I wanted to keep the party going. I wanted to bring people together. Like that was my purpose. It still is. Um, but you know, I didn't go try to make one. Right. Um, I think it's, it's to have, a real why, you know, like, what are you doing? It can change. It doesn't have to be cemented in stone necessarily, um, especially for younger entrepreneurs, you know, especially, but it, to really have like, like something that you really are going to be into and have a purpose. So let's just say that there's a purpose or there's just some value you're really creating. You feel that you can create value. Then I think, walk people through a you know, relatively sophisticated framework, but I start with identity and really try to figure out not only like who they are and their identity, but what's the, going to be the perception of mm. the the mm-hmm. consumer, the customer, the, the, uh, the inevitably the audience and to really try to see that from both sides and develop something, whatever it may be that's authentic because Authenticity is not everything, but authenticity is the, the the foundation. It's the beginning point. Like that identity needs to be glued together from both how it communicates what you want to do and what the perception of that customer is, that it feels authentic. It feels like, oh, that's something I can relate to. And then the yeah. next thing that I, I, I bring either, you know, entrepreneurs or young people through is, is trust. Like how are you going to, because trust is truly everything, right? It's the absolute, because that's like a gate that you have to get through. So how are you going to bring whatever it is you do to life and be trusted? Now, that would take a lot longer to, to talk through. But <laughs> but it's earned, too. It's not just like you just do this, this, and this. But like there are method, ways to, to build that trust. And before moving on, being transparent, you know, being a communicator, being honest and open and really communicating – the things that are going well and things that aren't. I mean, those are, that's a really important one. But then when you've established an, an identity that's relatable, you know, that's an identity that your audience cares about, then you've started to walk down the pathway of earning trust. Now you're ready for relevance. Yeah. Um, you're ready to be in the right time, the right moment. You're ready to create the right products, the right, just to be there in with the times, not necessarily trend following not even necessarily trend leading but just what's right for you and what's right for that audience and only sort of you and your brand knows that um but that's where the special stuff starts but you can't leave it there right that's not going to stand apart the brands that are standing apart these entrepreneurs that are succeeding are finding you know i I believe the most successful by the way are ones that are finding a way to help their customers reach further with possibility so that next piece is possibility it's 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 that aspirational like what are you doing like nike is is just do it and i don't know i think that i think that they do live up to that yeah um, you know i do believe that there's something inherently there there <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but but that and see if you're you know it's hard you now doing the aspirational that kind of possibility work is is it's not easy Let's just be clear, right? There's nothing easy about really, truly delivering on that. But if you do, 
if you do deliver on that, then you're ready for developing, creating the experience, an experience that most importantly, mm-hmm. look, we can talk experience mm-hmm. in lots of different ways and experience and this all weaves through one another, right? I'm not, it's not completely linear, but I'm talking it through steps. But if this experience is something like sort of beyond memorable and that experience is something that can, can bring people together and create a sense of belonging. Now the overall package is magic. It's pure magic. Um, but you got to execute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're right. I mean, all this is nice on paper. It's nice on video, <laughs> <Dude>. <laughs> but it's hard to create and then build and then maintain a new company. Um, I've done this quite a few times. I've helped well over a hundred brands and individuals do this successfully. Mm-hmm. And then I started one last week and I'm going, this is hard. <laughs> <laughs> my God. I mean, what, what chapter of my book do I got to look at for this issue? Like, holy crap. You know, I mean, you got to lean on, on everyone, you know, and it is like, Building a, a brand, a business is is a. Uh, it takes a village. I absolutely right. I don't know if that helped. I mean, I feel like you know that was my most direct, you know, pragmatic answer to the question. Yeah, no, one hundred percent. Now I'm curious to know though, what would you say when you're out there working with entrepreneurs or just seeing them at various levels? What of those steps are they skipping? What are the most common marketing mistakes that that people are making that keeps them from being relevant to not only the young audience but any audience? Well, a lot of times it's just what we as entrepreneurs think in our own head. So a lot of times the mistake is that we're just not listening to our our customer or or our targeted potential customer, and so we're caught in our head. I'm just talking about my own my own guilt of doing this um, and what I've observed is that we think we have this great solution when we might, but we potentially have missed the mark. And I've certainly done this in the past where we haven't really listened or involved our particular, you know, targeted customer or audience or people in the, in that process of, and that process could be right. That whole multi principle based approach but just in anything, just thinking through your plans, your strategy, your your product, your service design of that, really anywhere. I think a lot of times, the the I guess it's really not just big brands, but a lot of the big brands, what I see is still that kind of broadcast mentality where they're just pushing messages. Um, because it's easier to push messages than to spark a conversation. Um, sparking a conversation takes you know, some skill and and it takes, you know, an ongoing nurturing. And I think that is a, a really common mistake of just kind of treating marketing, even social media, which is supposed to be social, <laughs> like a bullhorn <laughs> and treating the feed like inventory. And I could kind of go on and on. Um, yeah. I mean, those are, those are a few, I mean, I got it. Probably we could to do a whole podcast on all the mistakes that the companies make. <laughs> no doubt. Not no that I'm d- the greatest at it, but I just happen to be at that that position to hear those mistakes firsthand a lot. Yeah, no, totally understood. Now, for those that have listened this far and want to pick up more and, and figure out more techniques that they could use to become relevant to their audience, what's going to be the best way for them to track you down? Well, I think if you want to learn about what – I do and my team is doing at Engage Youth Company. Go to engageyouth.com. And if you want to follow the sort of advice and the tips that I, that I, I provide sort of on entrepreneurship and, and youth marketing or, or reaching the modern consumer in general, would be going, going to LinkedIn. You can search my name, Greg Witt, or my handle is Think With Wit on most social media, Instagram, Twitter, and, and on LinkedIn. But LinkedIn's my my main my main place. Got it, one hundred percent. So, for I, I kind of have a final question for you because I'm curious to hear what your answer is going to be. You know, there's 
there's just so many things that that we've discussed and talked about and there's so many directions that marketing can go but yet i know that someone listening has managed to get to what i call that precipice of decision they've said you know what i i can make this happen i can take my company to a next level i can make mark you know i will i'm gonna do marketing okay apparently i have to they maybe that's their decision but you know like i know that when you reach that precipice what often happens is that we have a companion and that companion comes in the form of a voice and it's a voice that reminds us how it won't work and kind of like you said you know who is he to what do you think is gonna happen i mean you're gonna you're gonna do what you're crazy don't you remember what happened last time and for some people they're related to that voice. So oh, yeah. My question to you is as follows. Let's pretend that this time it's going to be different. This time they're going to follow through. In fact, Greg, they're going to do exactly what you say, and they're going to do so in the next 24 to 48 hours. What would you suggest that they do? Um, I would suggest that, just because I don't have any context, so I would suggest that anything that you do, you get really, really good at, at selling and communicating with full clarity your idea or your solution with a framework of, of what, why, you know, what, how, and why, mm. and be very, very clear um, and practical about what your, what your outcomes are going to be and make sure that those outcomes are, are, brilliantly connected into the to the what and the how and that that why matters it's like that your audience gives a shit about the why yep because if they do um if things start to go wrong chances are you're going to increase the likelihood of being successful now that is my answer to the the nebulous situation right <laughs> <laughs> Well, we didn't want to make it too easy for you. I know, I know. Okay, so I, I definitely want to be the first to say that I appreciate the fact that you're uh, adaptable, that you've been malleable. You've made the changes that have been required to make the the self-made path a, a possibility for yourself. And you're assisting other companies in doing the same thing and spreading their message and, and helping that to happen. So I definitely appreciate you taking the time to share your knowledge, your wisdom, and your insight here with us today at the Cashflow Diary. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm definitely going to pull some of your quotes from the beginning, too. You rock. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean today? Well, honestly, I think it means that it's time for all of us to get a little bit more clear, understanding that identity, building that trust, and helping to communicate what is possible when it comes to using our products and services. Because at the end of the day, you know, like I know, nothing happens until there's a sale, but that sale is built with identity, trust, and possibility. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been fun talking to you guys today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time. 